Gerrit, it is such a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Martin. It's a pleasure and a privilege on my side. Gerrit, as you know, we just opened our 50th class of the International MBA, and actually you are one of the pioneers. You are from the original class. At, at that time, it was not called the International MBA, but at that time, it was called the MEDE. I'm talking about groundbreaking, yes. innovation, and trend setting. I'm, I'm curious what brought you at that time to IB and what uh, stands out most for you from what you learned here. So, um, yeah, I have to give my dad uh, credit for this because um, I went to school in the United States. I, I studied actually humanities. I went to a liberal arts college where they taught me how to think. But my idea was really to become a military officer. Yeah, I did officer candidates to uh, school in Quantico, Virginia with the Marine Corps. And after graduation, I was offered a commission. So my dad, you know, he kind of felt queasy about that. Huh? Uh, and so did my mom, by the way. <laughs> And he said, well, why don't you, why don't you study business? Yeah. Um, I pay for it um, and because it's pretty much the same thing. You know, in both cases, you have armies yeah, uh, fighting against each other. Uh, you have ranks, you have, you know, you have generals, etc. The, the, the difference is nobody gets killed. Yeah. And, and he was absolutely right, because if I, if I look at, at myself right now, you know, working for Daimler, uh, yeah, it's Mercedes against BMW, against Audi. We do have uh, ranks here too, you know, president, vice president, whatever. Um, the way we do performance evaluations, very similar. A lot of things that uh, modern corporations use, they copied from, uh, from, from the armed forces uh, of any country. Um, but of course, since he was going to pay, he decided where. The obvious choice would have been in the US, yeah? but my dad was very wise, he liked the way the Spaniards, um, uh, he, he'd been working in, in, in Spain for a long time. He actually uh, retired there um, and then died there. Um, he liked the philosophy. Yeah? So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enroll you in the Spanish uh, business school and you're going to learn um, uh, yeah, international business, sure, but, but uh, in Spain. So, uh, so I did that. And um, the thing that struck me the most, especially now in hindsight, is uh, today, if you talk about selfless leadership, being available for serving others, being available for the greater good, etc. Um, yeah, this is a very modern thing. But in 1984, 1985, this was being taught and lived in uh, Instituto de Empresa. Yeah? This idea of selfless leadership long before Simon Sinek wrote, uh, you know, leaders lead last which, by the way, he copied from the Marine Corps, the original saying is officers eat last. Yeah. Long before that, uh, we, were, we, were, we were practicing that in, uh, in uh, Instituto Empresa. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Tommy Lasorda. He, he, he used to be the manager, baseball manager for the uh, Dodgers, he passed away very recently. But um, he used to say, if I can let them, and them being the players, if I, if I can have them play for the name on the front of the shirt, and not the name on the back of the shirt, I've done my job, yeah. And that's something that kind of was drilled into us uh, every day at the Instituto de Empresa. Well, uh, it seems you really have to thank your dad that you actually made it yeah. to, to IE Business School or at that time, Instituto de Empresa. Um, so, um, obviously, we already said this is uh, the 50th class, or we just opened the 50th class, and. As part of the festivities celebrating our 50th edition of the International MBA, we have created an exclusive group called the 50 Leaders Reinventing the World. Um, you are the first IMBA alumni selected thanks to your career trajectory with a remarkable impact. Um, a key part of leadership is inspiring positive change in those around you. And you obviously do that, so I'm curious, who inspires you and, and, and why? Well, um, the, the common theme of the people that inspire me are those that are able to take uh, something apparently complicated and then uh, express it, simplify it, yeah? Or express it in simple terms, yeah? So, of course, my generation was, um, we were caused to read a lot or we caused to listen to a lot to, uh, to, to Jack Welch, who's been often been you know, misread and misquoted, yeah. But um, 
this idea of simplicity, speed simplicity, self-confidence yeah, that uh, Welsh used to uh, preach at uh, GE, which made GE into such a powerhouse, was tremendously att attractive to me. There were a couple of other people, of course, Peter Drucker, you know, um, I, 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 uh, I, uh, everybody should read Peter Drucker at one point in time in their career. Um, there's a guy uh, that I uh, mentioned in uh, my past talks uh, to the students, Mark Horstman, who's the founder of Manager Tools. Also, the idea, very powerful, the idea of um, actionable recommendations. You know, managers today are very hungry for actionable recommendations. They don't want to hear about the theory or the history of how to give feedback. Yeah, they want to know how to, how to do it. Um, these people inspired me. I, I'll give you an example. This is Dieter Zetscher. I'm sure you, you remember him, our, our previous CEO. He was interviewed during the Geneva Auto Show one day. And the uh, journalist, you know, there was at least 10 minutes uh, to go before the end of the interview. So she, she threw her, him a bone. Yeah? She threw him the typical open-ended question, yeah? expecting a long answer. And the question was basically, what is the long-term vision of Daimler? And Setcher said, uh, zero emissions, zero exports. And it was so powerful, so powerful. It, 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 I still remember that. And, and that was the end of the interview, of course, no 10 minutes. So this is what, these are the people that inspire me. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, you already mentioned Daimler. Um, you have grown and evolved within the Daimler group for the past 30 years. I would like to know a little bit more how a big organization, how a big company like Daimler has enabled you to grow into the leader you are today? Well, the, the large companies have two, um, two advantages. Um, first of all, the size, we're more people. Yeah? So I work for a, a company that, is, um, that has 298,000 employees. So if 10% are brilliant, yeah, that's 29,000, almost 30,000 uh, uh, employees. So you have a larger proportion, although the percentage may be the same as in startup, you have 10%. So 10% of uh, 1,000 is not the same as 10% of 29,000. So you're surrounded by more talent. And the second advantage is we have, we have of course, larger budgets yeah, that enable you not only to do more things, but also to spend more on development of yourself and others. Yeah. So for a startup company that has maybe, I don't know, 100 employees, to send somebody to a development course uh, to uh, you know, advance leadership at IE Business School, it's unthinkable, it's impossible right now. Yeah? For a company like Daimler, no problem, no problem. Yeah? And we spend an extraordinary amount of money on developing our managers and making them better. Thank you. So obviously um, what we see is uh, clearly there's much more opportunities in a large organization, uh, at least in, in, in certain dimensions. Um, let me stick a little bit with your career at Daimler. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, obviously, IE Business School is an international business school, and our alumni find their professional lives spanning different companies from a range of countries. In your 30 years with Daimler, you have relocated and changed jobs a total of 12 times. Um, right. What are the keys to meeting the challenges of succeeding in the international marketplace? And how do you think um, does your international profile play into that? Well, uh, I think that uh, obviously, if you have an international background, yeah, especially if you if you speak languages, uh, it's going to be um, easier for you in the beginning to fit in. Yeah? But most importantly, and I and I mentioned that in one of our uh, talks. To, um, is uh, I'm going to introduce you to what we call the Wendy curve. And it's called the Wendy curve because the lady who developed it, Wendy Lord, you know, uh, that's her name. So basically what it says is that if you measure the aggregate, you know, the total number of, let's say, Japanese managers and compare them to the total number of German managers, of course, there's going to be a difference. But that difference is smaller than if you measure the difference between two members of the same group, two Japanese mem uh, managers, or two German managers. So my recommendation has always been manage, manage the individuals in, in your team. And sure enough, you know, I've had people in um, Turkey behaving more like Americans, like Americans. I've had Americans wishing they lived in a, uh, you know, social welfare state in Europe. I've had uh, Germans, uh, 
you know, dressing in, in, in Texas in, in cowboy uh, boots uh, and cowboy hats and behaving more like Texans, like than, than Texans, etc. So these stereotypes, yeah, uh, you need to kind of eliminate them and focus on the individuals uh, because every individual is going to be very different, no matter if they are part of the same uh, nationality. So Gerhard, we're not going to ask how you will dress up or how you typically dress up when you come to work. So we're going we're gonna to leave it there. Thank um, you. <laughs> let's focus a bit more on, on the job at Daimler. Um, it seems that over your career, you are often the point man for Daimler to build either new ventures or to fix existing ones. Um, yes. What are the most common mistakes that you have observed managers make? There is a famous quote there's many, first of all, Martin, and, I, I, and you know probably more of them than I do because you talk to more managers. Um, there's many, but the one that's, that, that jumps out uh, to me is, um, and let me, let me just um, quote uh, Stephen Covey, you know, and he said, you know, we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge others by their actions. Yeah? So we are tremendously easygoing uh, on ourselves and very tough on others. Yeah? So the, the number one mistake that I've see this uh, managers don't assume positive intent yeah. and nobody does something wrong because because you know willfully or or, or spitefully yeah. uh, they do that because they don't know any better and they need to be corrected via feedback and yet i see so many managers talking about you know attitudes this this person needs to be fired he has a bad attitude and then you ask well you know give me some specific examples about the behaviors that led you to believe that you know, there are not many um, so, so that's that's I think I would say that that is one of the major mistakes that I see when uh, I see managers managing other people. They're not, uh, yeah, they they don't they, they question the intentions when they should really focus on the behaviors. We're still in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, a new U.S. administration has just come into office. What do you expect from the first half of of 2021? For global businesses such as Daimler, um, it's the only thing we know about the future is that it's going to be different. Yeah, I'm quoting here. <laughs> so it's really difficult to to uh, to anticipate what's going to happen. What I expect to happen is, first of all, a more civil discourse between the United States and other countries. Thank God. Yeah, and I think that the new president is um, or will take necessary uh, steps to um, repair some broken relationships especially with our with 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 europe uh, that's that i think that's very, very necessary but also to reach out to countries like russia and china and say okay yes we disagree on many things but hopefully there are more things that we can agree on than uh, uh, than disagree but um, you know it's still a VUCA world there's no question about that yeah. um, I, I always kid when people ask me, what do you think is going to happen in Mexico? And I say, you know, long term in Mexico is next Friday. If I know what's going to happen next Friday, I'm a genius. I wouldn't be here. And uh, with regard to the world, maybe it's not next Friday, but the next six months, if I knew what was going to happen, I wouldn't be here. Uh, probably talking to you, I would be writing a book or something like this. Well, <laughs> I, I agree. Um, predicting the future sometimes might be challenging. Um, looking back over the past 30 years of your professional career, um, what basic management principles have you come to prize the most? Yeah, um, you know, there are many, and uh, many of them are self-evident, even if people don't fo follow them. The, the, the number one um, is whoever said, or whoever said first, it's all about people was there that was spot on, spot on. Yeah. And in my experience, um, great people will always overcome faulty systems uh, or procedures. Yeah, broken procedures, broken systems, etc. Will always be overcome by uh, by um, great people. But the opposite is not true. Yeah, um, brilliant uh, systems uh, will not um, prevail if you have below average uh, people. I know there's somebody who once said that, you know. Great systems or great uh, uh, great systems make average people great. I don't think so. Yeah, 
And there's an important corollary to, to what I'm saying um, that affects directly IE Business School because I firmly believe that if you gave me the choice between spending $1,000 on developing my, 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 my people, you know, sending them to an advanced management course, um, or $1,000 uh, to get a better system in place, I would spend uh, $1,000 rather on my people than on the system. So that's, that's for me the most important realization. Of course, you have to, to you also have the discipline to let them work, yeah? to take the step back, yeah? and, um, and also um, uh, talk less and listen more. Yeah? There's a famous joke about what's the opposite of talking, and uh, it's not listening, it's waiting to talk. Yeah? You can use that in any company. We use that in Daimler quite often. Yeah? What's the opposite of talking at Daimler? Yeah? It's waiting to talk. So um, hire great people, bring them on board, uh, let them do their thing. Uh, great people will also create uh, great uh, systems and then take the time to listen to what they're saying. Bert, thank you so much for this, first of all, very interesting interview, but at the same time, I want to take the opportunity um, to thank you because you are incredibly engaged in the community and support us whenever we need you. So I wanted to thank you as well, not only for this interview, but for all your commitment to the IE community. Thank you so much. Martin, it's my place to thank you. It's been a rare pleasure and privilege. And uh, I think I've, I have very fond memories of my time at IE Business School.